Tonight I'm going to be talking about um, the, how transport in Hertford and Hertfordshire can be made more sustainable. Um, I, I'm going to cover the broader points about climate change and so on, but also why we need to get away from car dependence in places like Hertford and how that can be done, looking at good practice from elsewhere, but also particularly looking at joining up transport and planning and new housing and saying that that's critical in terms of how we reduce traffic congestion in the future. Good on, but, uh, I'll bring another one. Okay, that's fine. But, uh, right. Yes, I've, I've forgotten about Jed Griffiths being likely to be here. I know Jed from uh, a long way back. He, he's here from CPRE Hertfordshire. But, uh, Malcolm, thanks very much and uh, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, I was uh, I, the uh, uh, CEO of um, what used to be called Transport 2000 and then um, only seven years after the year 2000 it changed its name um, because it took that long to get agreement uh, to campaign for better transport and um, having done that for 30 years I uh, thought it was more than time to step down and um, do other things. So I'm now doing a range of things which includes being a visiting professor at the University of Hertfordshire which is developing um, a smart mobility unit, a transport studies unit there, which is multidisciplinary, and I'll say a bit about that and what it's doing. And um, I'm uh, uh, doing um, a number of other things, including um, advising Transport for London and others on getting more control over local rail services um, and uh, across the country. I'm also trustee of, and for the purpose of this talk, this is um, useful, I think, I'm a trustee of something called the Foundation for Integrated Transport, which is a grant-making trust, one of the few that fund transport initiatives. One of its main projects is called Transport for New Homes. And Transport for New Homes is a project that's looking at the relationship between new housing developments and transport, um, which bizarrely very few people seem to have researched. And I'm going to talk a bit about that because I think it's highly relevant uh, to um, Hertford and Hertfordshire. So this says, um, so the challenge for, um, for transport in places like Hertfordshire. And the point about Hertfordshire is um, there's no one big city or town. It's a series of smaller places. It has very high car ownership and car use. It's got growing population and housing. The projection in, if you aggregate the local plans uh, and those at various stages across the county is of around somewhere between 90 and 100,000 homes over the next 15 years. It's the edge of, uh, of London, but it's not part of it in governance terms. And alternatives to car use, I don't need to tell this audience this, especially east-west and outside towns are poor. And all this leads to um, high and growing congestion with low speeds, in, especially in places like Hartford. And um, that's a, 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 the 2011 census um, sh uh, of car or van availability in Hertfordshire and um, uh, the, 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 the uh, <coughs> maroon on the left is 42% who have one car or van. The green, olive green at the top is the 31% who have two cars or vans. Um, and um, that, but there are 17% down there who have no cars or vans and there's a small group um, totalling about 10% who have three or more cars and vans. So high car ownership. And um, what that leads to is um, congestion. Um, the alternatives to car travel are or certainly are seen to be poor or non-existent for many journeys. Cycling is seen as dangerous, there's no effective priority given over other traffic. Buses across the county have been cut back and fares and increased. And many of the places people want to get to have been planned around cars and roads. And I've said this about Hartford, it could be about a lot of other places. And all of this creates what's known, what's been called car dependence. In other words, car use becomes a necessity and not a choice. And that is a problem for those who have cars, who have to drive um, uh, more and all those without cars that's 17 percent uh, with um, households and the people in car owning households who don't have access to the car who are excluded from society it's worth saying though and i want to talk a bit more about uh, more about this that that car dependency 
those kinds of shopping centres are, are not inevitable. And um, uh, car dependency creates um, other problems. Um, uh, there is, uh, and I'll, I'll go through these in more or less detail. Um, there is air pollution. And the point about air pollution from vehicles is um, we hear a lot more about it now. And the reason we hear a lot more about it now is actually we've got a lot more medical evidence about the damage being done to human health by air pollution from vehicles, particularly from diesel vehicles. Um, and there's now a lot more um, epidemiology, that's cross-population surveys and, um, uh, and research, and toxicology, which is working out what the, da the actual damage is from different pollutants to different parts of the body. And we now know that um, diesel particulates and also nitrogen oxides have, are linked to health damage, damage of health, literally from um, pre-birth to old age, um, to it's implicated now with Alzheimer's and, and a whole load of other things. So um, there, we now know that the impacts of um, air pollution on human health, and as I say, diesel vehicles are particularly implicated in this, are wider and worse than previously thought. And there are other health impacts from car dependence in terms of less physical activity, the rise in type 2 diabetes, and so on. Um, and, and then there are other things too. There's um, noise from uh, road and air travel. Um, the, there's the fact that road traffic dominates landscapes and public spaces and pu the public realm, which is um, no news to people here and in other um, historic towns as well. There are road casualties, and it's worth saying that although the UK has a very relatively good record in, in reducing road casualties, that's plateaued, and uh, we're now you know, not seeing the reductions that we have seen uh, in um, deaths and injuries from, uh, on the roads. And as I've mentioned, the social exclusion, um, uh, people without cars being locked out of society, and there's the uh, rise in isolation and loneliness, which has its own impacts. Um, that cartoon, for those at the back, um, has a, a child um, on, at a computer saying to his mum, you want me to stop playing video games and goes outside to play in all that air pollution? Um, so um, that, uh, which links up nicely some of those problems. But I think, above, we've known a lot of this, um, but above all, um, I think, there is now climate change and the implications of transport in that. Um, I won't go into detail about this because this is known, but um, the fact, uh, my point is simply that climate change and the need to tackle it adds urgency to doing something about this. You know, uh, temperatures increased by about one degree centigrade compared to the pre-industrial period. Um, the, the, the graph on the right is the global, uh, the, Im the, the projections for global emissions based on no climate policies at all, which take you to <coughs> up to 4.8 degree centigrade uh, uh, rise. Um, current policies, which take us to 3.7 degrees. The pledges that governments have made, which take us to two, uh, up to 3% th uh, rise. And then the pathways, including the 1.5 degree centigrade path, uh, pathway, which is what was committed to in principle at Paris. And in Glasgow this year, at the end of this year, the next UN conference is where people have to actually come to the table with real commitments to make that. And the reason I'm mentioning that, uh, obviously there's the extreme weather events, that was what happened in the, in the southwest, to the um, uh, seafront at Dawlish when the railway line was washed away, um, and there's the bushfires and floods and so on, extreme weather events. And the, the key point I wanted to make really is that because, is that transport has now overtaken energy as the largest emitting sector in the UK. Um, uh, we've seen huge reductions in power generation from waste and even from farming, uh, whereas from 2012 to 2017 emissions from transport actually went up 4% and um, uh, account for 27% in 2017 of greenhouse gases. Um, and that, I think, doesn't include international aviation shipping either, or Britain's contribution to it. So that's why it's important. Um, now, <coughs> when you say this, um, there is a tendency to say, it'll be fine, 
because technology <coughs> will solve the problem. Um, and you see that um, you know, there is a view that um, we just need to migrate to electric vehicles and that will cut pollution. Um, autonomous cars will move to driverless cars and that will eliminate road crashes and the need for parking, so that will reduce congestion. Um, we'll have lorries that will sort of join themselves up on motorways so that you won't need so many drivers and that that will make better use of the roads. And um, this is more of a North American argument, but you do hear it. We don't need to invest in public transport because we've got Uber and so on, and they'll just replace all public transport. We won't need any of that. In fact, one um, suburb in Canada did actually do that. Interestingly, the result was that their bill went up. Um, um, and that we'll have drones that will cut van traffic. And then, if you listen to Elon Musk, we'll create hyperloops and tunnels everywhere with um, hu hugely fast um, uh, things that will replace <coughs> rail, flying, long distance driving as well. And I suppose the point I wanted to make is that there are a lot of cautions about this. Um, electric vehicles are not yet mass market, though they are growing hugely, and new EU rules coming in this year will change this. Um, there are also issues about tyre and brake dust emissions from cars which electric vehicles still have, and which will keep some of the air pollution issues alive. There are, I think, a lot of issues with general use of autonomous vehicles. Um, yeah, li who's liable when, it, when cars, when they crash, um, uh, potential hacking, interactions with other road users, general public acceptability and so on. And there are issues with, with all these other things. We've seen what happens when drones get anywhere near airports. They, the airports get shut. Um, I think it's fair to say that Uber is going to be less interested in more rural areas than it is in um, places like London. And you still have congestion, car dependence and so on because electric vehicles will still get stuck in jams. And actually, the evidence is that although we do need um, for climate change purposes to move to electric vehicles, we also need to do something about traffic levels. And that's not um, that's coming from the, committee, the Independent Committee on Climate Change, which has talked about the need to reduce traffic levels as well as move to electric vehicles. Um, now, that isn't to say that technology can't help, because transport is getting smarter, because we're seeing uh, you know, Oyster Cards, we're seeing more door-to-door -door -to -door information and payment systems. You can even, um, the, it doesn't always work, but um, the bus companies here do have apps that tell you roughly where the buses are, if you go on there, the phone, and that's getting better. You get the conversation, um, but a more interesting point is that you now know a lot more, and this is, I think, a core point, in terms of working out what you're actually going to do in relation to transport, is there's a lot more real data around about the journeys people are really making. Um, I've just put one case study up there, which was some work that was done when I was at the Campaign for Better Transport with actually people from Hertfordshire and from Northampton, in Northamptonshire, um, which where they, for other reasons, they got data on something about 40% of all the trips in Northamptonshire, the origins and destinations, simply actually by going to get it, you know, asking schools and colleges and hospitals and so on, the big journey generators, um, how, you know, where are people coming from and to, getting anonymized data. And that showed you that on the A45 main road in Northamptonshire, you could find out that, that there were around 102,000, 100,000 car trips a day. We, we could also find out that 80% of them were single occupancy, so you could say, if you did even modest car sharing at those places, you could take out maybe 14,000 of those trips, and 4% of those car trips were under two miles. So if you made an assumption that you could switch 80% of those to cycling, that would be another 4,000 trips. And that meant you could take 20% of car trips on the A45. Now, the point of that is not, you know, the, and those, by the way, were fairly conservative assumptions about what you could do. The point I was going to make is that whereas a lot of transport planning has been done on the basis of surveys and models. We now have the capability of getting real data, including data from mobile phone da phones and others, anonymized, to do actually what, find out what's really going on. You often find that there is an argument that, uh, you know, in favor of, say, 
bypasses in places where well, it would get rid of all the through traffic. And when you do the analysis with this sort of thing, you discover that most of the traffic is actually local. I remember ages ago getting some data for Hereford, where there's been a long-running argument about a bypass, which showed that 36% of the car trips going through Hereford were actually going from the estates to the south of the town to one of five major employers to the north of the town. So modest car sharing there would make a difference. So my point about in moving towards sustainable tra trans travel for a place like Hartford is you can actually need to collect and analyse the data and it's now much easier to do that. <clears throat> um, so what might be the other elements in that? I'm just going to go through a few of these. Um, I think the you know, people talk about better public transport and of course that's necessary. What I've done here is to say a little bit more about what that might mean in practice that isn't just about um, uh, the, the conventional uh, transport because I think the core point is that um, you can use da the data I've mentioned to plan shared transport routes. One of the things that um, was discovered in the North Hampshire case when you did that mapping uh, of where people were travelling to, that the conventional bus network which had been there for decades didn't actually serve any of those routes. Um, so actually there's an opportunity to use data to do something different. Um, so there's what I put up here as some principles about the sort of thing you might do. I have put in light rail, that's a picture in the top right hand corner, the Nottingham tram. I want to come back to the Nottingham tram because that's got the financing of that has been particularly interesting. But that's, Nottingham is a medium sized city, it's got three tram lines. Um, which does suggest that you don't need to be a very big place to have trams. Um, that I, I have, for purposes of balance, put um, a picture of a guided bus. Um, um, that's, I think, the Lee Guided Busway in Greater Manchester. Greater Manchester has invested in guided bus as well as its tram network. But I've also put in um, some other things about this, um, which is about transport hubs. And um, this sounds... Uh, unusual in this country. Actually, Hertfordshire has been relatively better than a lot of places in creating interchanges at some of the stations. So places like Hatfield and St Albans and Elstree have you know, some kind of interchanges between bus and, and, and rail. Um, but they're not genuine um, sort of hubs in the way that you can genuinely link up all kinds of public and shared transport. Um, the one I particularly wanted to mention was that wheel in the bottom right hand corner. I'm not expecting anybody to read bits of it, but that's um, a wheel of um, the integrate, the one public transport network for Cornwall. And Cornwall is busy creating at the moment um, an, a genuinely integrated public transport network, and it's doing it in lots of different ways. So those are all the, the, the sort of segments. But um, it has, for instance, introduced, just introduced, uh, a clock face timetable on, its, on the railways there so that um, the, tr the branch lines meet the main lines. From April, they've got new bus timetables coming in by agreement with commercial operators and through the tender services they support where the buses will meet the trains. This sounds extraordinarily radical. Um, <laughs> but um, but, but uh, my point is that Cornwall have been able to make this work, they've, and they've done it through a version of the partnership framework which, I'll, which Hertfordshire are about to implement and which I'll come back to later. Um, and um, they've also developing uh, an integrated ticketing scheme for the whole county. Um, bear in mind, Cornwall's approach is, you know, Cornwall's position is different from Hertfordshire in that it's obviously catering for a big visitor economy, but they've also built hubs at, play, at some of the main railway stations um, and um, they've been able to just sort of seize bits of money as it's passed as, it, as it's passing as it were um, so that for instance they got their local enterprise partnership to pay for contactless ticketing technology on all the small bus operators even down to the smallest ones so um, I, I put that in partly because um, uh, just to show what an integrated approach might mean and the fact that Cornwall is doing this stuff, and I don't think they haven't got any more powers than Hertfordshire has, um, they have the advantage, potentially advantage or disadvantage, of being a single tier. So they, they, they don't have, they, they're just the county council, they don't have a district councils now. Um, so integrated timetabling. 
I, the, the picture there is a demand responsive bus. Um, I'll come back to that too, but it's worth just saying that there's a move towards kind of semi-fixed route buses, demand responsive as they're called, where you can uh, now get them as apps on the phone. And it's the case that Arriva, um, who are of course the main bus operator around here, are launching what they call Arriva Click in Watford in March, under contract to Watford Borough Council. Um, and um, uh, and it will be interesting to see what happens. Um, Arriva Click has been also used elsewhere. It's been used in new housing. It's uh, been uh, in a new housing development in Leicestershire. And the idea is that it's somewhere between uh, a taxi and a bus, um, but, and, but it does provide a, a, a more flexible service, particularly where you haven't got the level of density. I've also said integrated ticketing and fares, youth fares. Um, uh, young people get a, a particularly poor deal from public transport at the moment because although they're expected to stay, they're required to stay on school to 18. A lot of the half fares stop at 16, and it's all a mess. Um, it's worth just saying I put a my ticket logo up there. The my <coughs> ticket logo is um, of a um, is what happens in across the whole of the Liverpool city region, uh, all you know the whole conurbation where there's a simple flat fare for young people in full time education. <coughs> Uh, or in tra in training, uh, where they pay £2.20 a day for the, uh, uh, for travel and a uh, similar weekly cost. And that was put in um, as a simple system. Uh, there wasn't anything like that before. On the basis, actually, for some of the poorest uh, parts of Liverpool, um, kids weren't going to school on Thursday and Friday because their parents couldn't afford it. So the councillors put that in um, against, I think uh, it's fair to say, the... Um, uh, the, the um, strenuous objections to the bus operators who said you'll, you'll kill us, you know, this will be terrible. Um, so the local authority guaranteed the, you know, the, any losses, as a result of which there's been a 143% increase in young people using buses in the conurbation um, uh, in the last uh, four or five years since that scheme came in. And that suggests that actually um, youth fares, uh, simple um, flat fares for young people, actually simple fares generally, but um, uh, actually uh, are important. Um, and um, the, uh, the final one I put down there is Seven Oaks Town Council actually has um, got through what they call the Route 8 because they couldn't see anybody else in Kent or Seven Oaks actually putting in a service that would serve new housing developments and link it into the centre. So they worked with a local bus operator and, uh, and, got, it in them, and got them to do it themselves. So they now have a, a new Route 8. So I, I'm mentioning that simply because um, uh, one of the things um, that we're seeing now is local neighbourhood town and parish councils doing stuff themselves um, and, and doing wider mobility options. That picture in the top left is Whitney, where the town council has... Um, organised with, in fact, the co-op movement, a set of local bus services that travel around and link Whitney to the surrounding area. Um, but there are other options too. There are car clubs where you share, um, uh, you can get access to a car at the end of the road or elsewhere. Um, uh, there is car sharing, which is now widespread, and we're starting to see more of that um, being organised. There's an outfit called Lift Share. Um, which has teamed up with some of the big car hire firms like Enterprise to do shared assets where your car, you might drive a car into work, the car at work will then deliver parcels, it might do at, you know, uh, journeys at work, it might then be used by somebody else for a leisure trip in the evening. Um, so the idea is that you move away from have, uh, lots of people having their own car to having access to cars. Um, and they're trying, and that's a new uh, approach. Journey aggregators, uh, there's a, something called SNAP, which aggregate coach, a demand for coach journeys with existing coach operators. So you see a lot of new ideas coming through. And then there is bike share and bike hire. And it's worth saying that both Watford and Stevenage, Watford again, launching uh, a, um, a Doppler bike hire scheme like the London one, um, again in March, um, with um, docking points over the town. Um, and uh, Stevenage is also about to, I think, has formally commissioned uh, to do that. So we are starting to see the idea of bikes. And it's just worth saying that um, e-bikes, I'll come back to that, um, 
electric bikes do provide a completely different cycling experience because you can go much further you don't have to um, sweat so much you know they are a much uh, they are changing the nature of bike travel so I, I put all these down there more just to say there are all these new mobility offers and there are community transport and social enterprises <coughs> coming into this area and uh, you know, the, so there are opportunities for doing quite new and different things um, I mentioned briefly that Hertfordshire were starting to, were, were about to pilot new bus um, and doing new buses. This is a consultation that has closed, that, that happened at the end of last year and which is um, the county are now sifting through the results. Essentially there are new powers available to local authorities on buses. They came in in a Bus Services Act in 2017 and they allow um, uh, potentially London style franchising where they like in TfL who let contracts for all the buses there but they also have the concept of an enhanced partnership which allows um, local authorities to do much more uh, in terms of coordination and work with both um, with the operators and the I, um, I mean this is all as I say being um, you know considered but uh, the pr partnership proposals um, included a range of headings including prioritise a much better bus priority uh, but also work on roadworks, bus priority, tackling bottlenecks and so on, improving the image of, of bus travel including uh, implementing minimum standards for bus services uh, so that people running old and decrepit buses wouldn't be allowed on the roads, um, better marketing and branding, building on the interlink brand, upgrading bus infrastructure including coordinated investment on corridors and better interchanges, um, and um, closer integration of the bus network with more multi-operator and contactless ticketing and then smarter use of data information including better real-time information in the way that I've described and some of this is already done that's the Maylands bus that um, operates in the Maylands business park over <coughs> in um, or Hempstead um, that's the Hatfield interchange I mentioned Uno is one of the bus operators here already do contactless Arriva also do it so um, you know uh, I'm putting this up not to say that this is all going to be great, all, only to say that there are new powers available and Hertfordshire is going to be one of the first places to try them and we'll have to see whether it makes a difference. Um, alongside this though, I'll just take another sip of water. Alongside this though, um, there's a fa the fact that a lot of car trips are very short distance. Um, 35% uh, of car driver trips and 41% of car passenger trips in Hertfordshire were under three miles in I think the 2011 census I think that's where that data comes from um, and it's quite clear that good walking and cycling provision can replace some of these but only if you give proper priority to pedestrians and cyclists um, over other traffic um, uh, in terms of provision and, and intersections and so on. Uh, I've mentioned briefly the, they're the Mini Hollands as they were called in London which was um, implemented by the, the previous mayor Boris Johnson um, and um, which um, in particularly in Walthamstow which has really went for this um, they didn't actually close off lots of streets there they, they didn't pedestrianize them or make them all cycle only um, they just made them that bottom left hand picture you know, more um, uh, traffic friend, you know, the, the traffic was less uh, allowed in, in parts of the neighbourhood, kept to main roads with um, proper provision um, for pedestrians and cyclists. And the result, um, people on average in Walthamstow did 32 minutes extra walking and 9 minutes extra cycling a week compared with other boroughs, and air pollution. Um, uh, was reduced so that 51,000 households in Walthamstone no longer suffer illegal air pollution. Um, there is stuff already in Hertfordshire. There, are, walk, there have been walking buses at schools, bikeability training and cycle parking at stations already there. Um, we've seen, um, you yeah, know, that has made a difference. Um, St Albans, where I live, um, there's a lot of cycling at the station now, a lot of cycle parking um, and more going in. So, you know, there, 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 there is... There's clearly, in some cases, the opportunity for some of this. Um, bike car schemes might work. Um, they have had their problems in the past. As I say, we're now going through a new round of those. Um, uh, but, and electric bikes, as I've said, might be a game changer. That's one at the top right-hand corner. So 
there are opportunities for, 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 for this. The, the, the prize is that a lot of short uh, car trips in Hertfordshire, as I say, are short distance, and actually doing something about that um, would, could make a real difference to traffic. And, and that's, yeah, nationally, 60% of car journeys are under five miles, so encouraging walking and cycling um, could make a real difference uh, in general. That is about safe routes. That diagram there is the Mayor of London's Healthy Streets strategy, and it says um, it's all the things you need to do to make a healthy street, um, with things to see or do, people uh, feeling safe, people choosing to walk and cycle, not too noisy, and so on. And that's now one of the three main driving um, strategies within the Mayor's Transport Strategy in London, hence the Mini Holland Scheme and so on. Um, but there are simple things that can be done about safe routes to schools and workplaces and so on, better signing, better cycle parking, better street design like advanced stop lines at lights and speed management where people live. So you've got those opportunities for this. Um, but I think none of that really matters if you uh, don't link um, land use and transport. And I mentioned at the start that I'm involved in this Transport for New Homes project, which is the first time anybody's actually gone out and looked at what's being built out there, particularly outside the cities. You'd, be, you'd think that it would be worth people finding this out. But I think, um, it, so this was a report. You can find it on transportfornewhomes.org.uk if you want to look it up. Um, and this report... Um, looked at 20 urban extensions um, uh, in different parts of the UK and did some comparisons with the Netherlands and Sweden. Um, <coughs> that's, uh, I think, a Swedish housing estate in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and there were various themes that came out of this work, um, which is a lot, a lot of new housing developments are based around the car and promote car-based living. Um, they build housing in the wrong place, so you actually build it in such a place where you couldn't actually do anything other than drive. Um, uh, people relied, as a result, people relied on the cars in most of those 20 extensions for the great majority of their journeys. Parking and road access took up so much room that it meant that there were, it had a severe impact on the public realm. There were few, comparatively few, urban trees and gardens um, because there wasn't space for them, and the destinations that the people drove to were often car-based too. So you can see there the kinds of places with mostly so, uh, lots of car parking. Um, and what you also see, actually there was a report in the, the last couple of days released about this from UCL uh, and others, um, which went over some of this. Um, the, what you also see is that we're now actually... Um, building homes without pavements on the American model because there is a belief that people won't walk. Actually, when some of the Transport for New Homes researchers went to an estate, I think in Northamptonshire, and walked around the place looking for someone to have a coffee, a car drove up, and, and it was one of somebody from the developers who said, what are you doing here? And they said, and they said well, we're walking around looking for someone to have a coffee. He said, I wonder what you're doing, because nobody ever walks here. Um, and I, I think the point is that we're now seeing, it's not like there aren't uh, you know, uh, pavements inside the development. What you get are what are known as red line issues, so that to get outside the development, neither the developer nor the council will pay for pavements. So what you get, that picture in the bottom right-hand corner, is people walking, this is, I think, in Trowbridge in Wiltshire, along a 50-mile-an-hour lorry route on a narrow grass verge in order to get a pint of milk. Um, and similarly, you get those big roundabouts which in some cases people had to cross. There was a development in Stamford, near Stamford in Lincolnshire, um, where um, the people moved in and the only way they could walk, uh, get anywhere on foot was across some roundabout like that. And then they discovered there was this little footpath and they went along the footpath and then got uh, solicitors' letters from the landowner and the developers saying that they had no right to do that and there was no right of way and they would be sued for trespass if they carried on using this footpath uh, because there wasn't a link to it. Um, what we, we, one of the 20 we looked at was Poundbury, which is the Prince of Wales development in, near Dorchester. And that had a, we put that in rather as a, as a, a bit of a, pro, uh, as a sort of um, uh, alternative because Poundbury has deliberately mixed land use. That's a picture of Poundbury in the bottom left there. It has local services, local shops, businesses, and it does have car parking, but the car parking is hidden away behind rather than in front of the houses. Um, 
And um, as a result, in the 2011 census, 31% of journeys to work were, on, were not by car, um, which means that you're talking about what we call here urban quarters rather than isolated developments. Um, better practice does exist. I mentioned Poundbury. Um, Kidbrook in south-east London uh, has um, you know, a development that's the bottom left in there, uh, has lots of green space and bus services and so on. Um, Shawfair, top of bottom right, that's a new station built, um, insisted on by the Scottish Government when they reopened the railway line into the borders from Edinburgh. Um, it, they were roundly criticised because in the first few years nobody was using the station. That was deliberate. They were putting the station in before the development arrived um, uh, and uh, so as, a, as a hub for a new town and commuter settlement for Edinburgh. Um, and Kent, there's fast tracks, there's guided buses around Ebbsfleet, even Leighton Buzzard has a dash direct bus service linking the uh, urban extension, the extension of Leighton Buzzard to the railway station and so on. Transport for New Homes has created a checklist um, which allows people to vet new housing um, developments to see how well um, they, um, uh, th they map, uh, that they shape up on these criteria. Um, and we're starting to get inquiries even from developers um, who want to make use of this. So what does that mean for Hertfordshire? Well, um, if we have 100,000 car-based homes, it will make congestion and pollution a lot worse. I don't think there's any disagreement about that. So high-quality public transport has to be at the centre of development, not an afterthought. It's worth saying that on the current planning system, which tends to be developer-led, particularly outside cities and in places like Hertfordshire, in terms of land allocation, um, five-year housing land supply uh, targets are required by government from local authorities and so on. The transport is treated as an afterthought, and uh, one of the transport, for new homes, the transport for New Homes coordinators said she went to a public inquiry into a local plan where when transport was raised, the, the inspector said, well, I think we'll consider transport along with bats at the end of the process. Um, so um, uh, no other country in the world, even I'm not even sure the states, uh, a lot of US states would do this, would think about it like that. So our argument is that you have to have public transport at the start, you have to have developments and surrounding roads that prioritise walking and cycling, the density of developments and the levels and design and car parking will be important and there should be local services and facilities that people can walk or cycle to. That picture in the top right hand corner is Dickens Heath in Solihull where a primary school has been built at the start. Um, so uh, uh, given particularly for here with uh, the Gilson uh, Garden Town uh, in Harlow, this is going to be important. And actually the next Transport for New Homes report, which should be out in a couple of months, is looking at the um, uh, 20 of the garden towns and villages proposed nationally, including Gilston, <coughs> to see um, what um, is actually promised on the ground. And the preliminary results show that there are great master plans which are ending up with big motorway junctions um, because of the application of strict rules about capacity of the nearby network um, and uh, transport and planning appraisal systems. So um, you know, we will hopefully be able to show what's actually happening on the ground and where the money's going. Um, I, I briefly wanted to mention, um, uh, I, I'm conscious of time and I, I'll finish up in a minute, but I wanted to mention one or two other things. Um, freight transport, um, because van traffic is growing fast, um, there are opportunities for zero emission vans, but there are also opportunities for the cargo bikes. And DHL, that bottom right hand uh, picture, DHL have been investing in cargo bikes in cities. Um, electric cargo bikes can go a long way. Government is now providing funding for those. You can have consolidation of freight and new forms of rail freight, actually. That's, that's an old Thameslink train that's being converted to take freight um, in, from um, into Liverpool Street station from, I think, um, Tilbury Docks and elsewhere. Um, so there are new ideas for doing rail freight differently, um, which might look a little bit like old ideas for doing rail freight with parcel, high value parcel delivery and so on. Um, so I only wanted to mention that because everybody forgets about freight in transport, but it is very important. Um, I wanted to mention finance and funding because everybody goes, well, how are you going to pay for this stuff, this kind of stuff? And there are different ways of doing this. Um, uh, there are, for example, the concept of what's known as total transport. And what we found in general is there are lots of different public bodies 
clinical commissioning, groups for non-emergency patient transport, school transport and so on, which commission transport services. And there are opportunities to bring those pots of money together and fund a much better public transport network as a whole. So there's quite a lot of interest in that. There's some school buses at the bottom right-hand corner. There's the opportunity to use private sector funding to pool developer contributions to create business improvement districts. But I think there's a broader point, which is a longer term one. If we are going to move, as the government is committed to, to moving away from <coughs> diesel and petrol vehicles altogether by 2040 or even earlier, um, all that fuel tax revenue will disappear. So we will need new ways to pay for roads, which might mean that road pricing becomes something that has to happen rather than something that people keep putting off. So pay-as-you-drive um, motoring might be something that happens. But there are other opportunities. Just, uh, just keep track of what I'm doing. I'll speed up because I'm conscious of time. Um, I mentioned the Nottingham Tram. The Nottingham Tram was part financed by a levy on workplace parking spaces. So employers in Nottingham who have 10 or more parking spaces uh, for their workforce pay something like 300, it's, it's a bit more now because it's on an inflation, 300 pounds per space per year. That has raises somewhere around 9 million pounds a year, which goes into transport, which is part paid for lines two and three of the tram, an electric bus fleet, upgrades to the main railway station. 40% of trips in Nottingham are now by public transport, which is among the highest levels outside London. So there are opportunities for innovative ways of financing transport. Um, and there are also opportunities to do interesting things just in relation to doing things with, uh, on relation to travel generators. Because the people who actually generate travel, employers, schools, hospital, leisure providers, can reduce single occupancy car trips. And for the reasons I mentioned, that can make a big difference. Um, so you've got um, uh, there, um, a, a, the top left-hand corner is Kesgrave School in Ipswich, where something like seven out of ten of the kids cycle to school because it's been made really easy for them. There are good cycle routes. There's lots of cycle parking. There's lots of cycle training and so on um, in a new development. Um, there's the bottom <coughs> left is Latitude Festival, which is uh, one of the festivals that's made a big thing out of getting people not to drive there, um, and so on. I, it's worth saying the University of Hertfordshire has a good track record here because um, it's got the Uno Bus Company. It's also got one of the longest standing e-car clubs um, with something like two or three hundred members in it um, and um, a park and ride and so on. So Hertford, the university itself has shown what can be done. It's worth just mentioning that Hertfordshire County Council have now, possibly under pressure from this society among others, um, actually employed some travel consultants to do some proper um, travel planning for not just the county hall but for um, it's satellite sites in Stevenage and Hemel Hempstead um, and they may start there and work up to County Hall but they are now, uh, there's now actually some work being done to do something about car travel to County Hall and to uh, the County Council so they are at least starting to walk the walk. Um, and I mentioned that businesses can do things, there's lots of opportunities for businesses to do things in just in terms of travel planning um, giving pedestrians priority in site design, good access for um, cyclists and parking on, on site, car sharing with a guaranteed ride home, some employers have done that, uh, flexible start and finish times, all of those are opportunities that have been done by a number of businesses, um, public and private, um, and uh, can make a difference. Um, and I think the point is that travel behaviour can change. Um, there was, in the coalition government, there was something called the Local Sustainable Transport Fund. Half of you got some money from that. And the assessment of that has found that did lots of different small projects across England. And the assessment has found that car use fell relative to other areas. Adult cycling increased across those areas by 6.6% .6 relative to other areas. There was a 4.1% reduction in car commuting. Carbon emissions per head fell by 6.9%. The projects were very high value for money. A similar program of cycling cities and towns saw an average increase in cycling over five years of 24 to 29%. So the, the, this shows that you can change travel behaviour with lots of small projects and actually over a relatively small um, period of time. Um, I've meant the university um, connection. Um, the point I was saying to Malcolm earlier, 
the thing that the University of Hertfordshire, which is now has this smart mobility unit, is doing is to start to look at what we do about places like Hertford, about Hertfordshire. Because actually, if you look at the research on transport, it's all about cities. Uh, and there's good reasons for that, because that's where lots of people are and where lots of transport problems are. But there is now a consensus, I think, on the need to look at and research options for more rural areas. And the university is working with Hertfordshire County Council and others to monitor and evaluate round, uh, transport initiatives, create round tables with policymakers to explore options and link with government and others to start to create a research agenda, looking, for example, evaluating things like the demand responsive transport I mentioned and so on. Um, so, um, and I think, just to conclude, the challenge now is to move away from car dependence, to move to less car-based development, better public transport, making cycling and, and walking real options safe and pleasant, and using new technology to make transport work. And I think this is about what I call here smart growth, not dumb growth. But, and that's um, a, a picture of what happened in China when somebody decided to hold out against a road scheme. Um, uh, they just got it built around them. But I think the, the serious point on the stats here is that um, you know, we've seen, you, you can choose your future. These are city stats. And in Vienna, car use has fallen uh, dramatically. Um, Los Angeles you know, doesn't, ha has lots of car use, though even they now are changing. That uh, thing in the bottom right-hand corner is their proposal to rebuild all the tram lines they ripped up in the 1940s. Um, and in London, we've seen a huge change over the last 30 years. In 1993, cars accounted for 46% of trips, public transport was 30%. By 2016, that had flipped. So in 2016, cars accounted for 32%, public transport 45%. A quarter of the journeys across Westminster Bridge are now by bike. We've seen, we've seen a huge change as a result of long-term planning. And we're now seeing other cities doing that. The challenge is to make that work elsewhere. So just in conclusion, I'm conscious of time, um, transport in places like Hertfordshire needs to move towards sustainability for all sorts of reasons. Better public shared transport, better options for short journeys, working with travel generators, including the County Council, better new housing developments, reviewing the price and availability of parking, reallocating road space to sustainable transport, bus priorities, <coughs> cycle networks, traffic light priorities, and creating partnerships, community <coughs> involvement and alliances to make a difference. So my concluding point, transport in Hertfordshire can be greener and the cartoon at the top right hand corner has a climate summit with energy independence, preserving rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, clean air, and somebody's going, but what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> and I think the conclusion is we can create a better world and it won't be for nothing. Thank you. Right, thank you very much.